Hey everyone, welcome to Building EnterGuys. On this episode, we're going to take a deep dive into lithium ion battery cells. Then we're going to design and 3D print the battery module holders and then assemble them so that their battery packs are ready for installation into the warp floor. I also love, love, love batteries, even more than I do aluminum. First, let's review some key terms so that we're all on the same page. Stay with me here. I often get asked the difference between voltage, ampage, and wattage. So let's clear that up real quick. Voltage is the speed of power. It's the force or pressure of the power. I like to think of a voltage as a car on the freeway. How fast it's going is the actual voltage, amperage. That's the unit of measuring the volume of power. So how much power is actually moving? I like to think of amperage as the number of cars and lanes on a freeway. And then we have wattage. That's the unit of measuring power. Often you'll see wattage numbers on chargers, on light bulbs. So wattage is calculated by multiplying the voltage, which is the speed of the power, times the amperage, which is the amount of the power or the volume. So using our example, think about wattage as being the speed of the cars, that's the voltage, times the number of cars or lanes, that's the amperage. When you multiply those together and get the wattage, you know how much power is actually being delivered. So wattage can be expressed as a unit over time. So if you're using a hairdryer that's 1,000 watts over an hour, that's one kilowatt hour, or 1,000 watts per hour. And often, kilowatt hours is what's used to express the size of the battery packs in electric vehicles. Now let's talk about batteries. Did I say I love batteries? I think I did. If you haven't seen 18650 cell yet, there you go. It kind of looks like a AA battery, but it's a bit bigger. 18650 is the name of it, and that's because it's 18 millimeters across this way and 65 millimeters across lengthwise. It's a bit bigger than a AA battery and fully rechargeable. So this is a lithium ion cell and it has a nominal voltage of 3.7 volts. That means that when it's fully charged, it'll be 4.2 volts and when it's fully depleted, it'll be around three volts. So the more voltage it has is how much capacity it currently has. So you can keep charging the battery and the voltage will increase. And this is how you can test capacity. So there's like LG, there's Panasonic. This one has a good balance between capacity. So a high capacity 3,400 milliamp hours, but also has a pretty good discharge rate. So I can actually pull quite a lot of amperage out of this battery at once to drive the motor or a very high like base hit on the sound system or if all the lights are on, like let's say white. Whenever there's like a big need for a lot of power at once, the Panasonic cells actually can pull a lot of amperage and those are measured in C. So what that means is they can pull 2C out of the battery. That means that it's two times the capacity. So if the capacity of this battery is 3,400 milliamp hours, then that means you can pull 6,400 milliamps out of it at once, at like a rate. This one specifically is a Panasonic battery and it's green color. Different manufacturers use different colors. You can tell if you look at the previous Arcar's battery pack, because I used used laptop batteries. There was LG, Panasonic, and there's different types of those batteries. And they were like brown, they were purple, kinds of packaging, and the Panasonics are known to be green. And I really, really wanted a green battery for my warp floor because I wanted people to see the batteries. So cosmetically, I wanted that look to be really bright. And it's either gonna be like a blue battery, which would probably be great, or a green battery. So I found green Panasonics. Compared to the previous art car where I had these used laptop batteries that are definitely like one or two generations old because they were like the, one of the first lithium ion 18650 cells, those had like 2400, 2200 milliamp hours brand new. And now that they were used for the art car, because I bought them as, as used laptop batteries, those would only have like 2000 milliamp hours. So this new cell has 3,400, so I can get away with the same battery cell account, I would have 50% more capacity. So I decided to use these NCR 18650B cells in the R car, and I wanted brand new ones. So I went to Alibaba to see if I can figure out the best price. I found a few vendors that were able to do bulk negotiations so that I ordered a few hundred cells from each one of them and got a bulk discount on the order and then the shipping cost is, is almost fixed so that that bulk order actually became a lot more economical than just buying a single cell at a time off of Amazon Prime. I believe it was almost six or seven dollars for a single cell on Amazon Prime versus around three dollars, three thirty, three forty on Alibaba when I bought them in bulk. Now that we have individual battery cells, we need to put them into battery modules to form the battery packs. In the previous prototype R car, I just soldered together the battery cells to create a big battery pack. But this year I want to do something different. I want people to actually see the battery cells. I want the holders to be translucent so that I can edge light them with LEDs to form the visual component of the warp floor. So I started to design the perfect battery module that I could 3D print. Most battery pack designs have the cells facing upward so you can pack in as many as possible for the platform of the vehicle. But since I want to actually see the battery cells, we have to lay them flat in the platform. The platform that we just built is three inches tall. The first inch is used for air gap and for the LED strips to light the battery packs. The other two inches will be used for the battery packs themselves. 
Now it's time to actually 3D print the battery module design, and this is all new for me. So let's talk about 3D printing. I started 3D printing when I got my first 3D printer from this little startup that I used to work next to in Ideal Lab. Ideal Lab is this little incubator which hosts a bunch of startups that just got the angel funding. I was next to this one called Mod T, and they made this little printer, and that was my first 3D printer ever. So I was able to like learn how to design stuff very simply in Tinkercad, and then send them to the printer and have it printed out. It did not have a heated bed, didn't have a lot of stuff, but it was a really simple and elegant kind of printer that made printing relatively easy. What I learned though, was after I actually designed my battery module to fit those you know, batteries in, I could never get it to print successfully. So this thing here was actually a 24 hour print in that little printer. Whenever it got to the top right here, it actually hit this, the nozzle would hit this, the bed would come off of the mechanism and had to move the bed so that it would be unaligned and they would start printing off of the edges, as you can see there. So after 24 hours of printing, this was a failure and it didn't really work out. So I decided to buy a Monoprice Ultimate Maker, Monoprice Multimate, Multimate? Oh my gosh, Multimate Maker, who named this printer? So I decided to buy a Monoprice Maker Ultimate 3D printer. This is basically a relabeled Wino D6, which is a Chinese manufacturer. Now begins the challenge of mass printing those battery module holders. 760 of these need to fit in the floor of the vehicle to power my battery pack. So that means that I need to put 760 of these into here. And each one of these battery modules holds 10 cells. So I need 76 prints of these. So I need to figure out a way to speed up printing. My hackerspace is called Crashspace LA and there's a bunch of amazing, brilliant people. And I had some of them help me out to do some test prints. So these are some of them here. I think that these are on a Prusa and they actually came out really, really nice. This is a black, this was a white, and then there's a green one, which is pretty cool. I like that color. And these are really cool prints. At the end of the day, I was like, I need to print a bunch of these and they all take 15, 16 hours. I need to print these out within a matter of weeks so I can actually start building the battery pack so I can actually make some progress in the art car. So how do I speed up the printing? Well, I could buy more printers, but I do have a budget for the car. So I decided that I'm gonna not do that. I wanna to stick to one printer I have. And what I wanted to do to speed it up was I actually took this design and I simplified it a bit. So I took up plastic where it didn't need to be to keep the rigidity that I needed. I figured out kind of like, okay, how rigid does this need to be? So what's in the floor? How much load can it withstand? The floor is gonna kind of hold the weight of people. But just in case, I wanted to make sure that this was strong enough to hold you know, a few pounds and it's not gonna like crumble. And then that it was light enough that it wasn't gonna use a ton of plastic and cost me a fortune in plastic. So I basically started thinning it out. And as you can kind of see, the insides are kind of hollow. So inside here, plastic kind of ends and there's like empty spacing, empty parts inside to basically keep the function of minimizing the form. And what I also did was I put the enter guys lettering right here and also the capacity information in the actual batteries because I knew what cells was gonna put into here. The battery module design had several requirements, including fit together modules. Also put grooves in the sides so I could stack covers to them. And that's the first time I've ever designed and printed parts that actually fit together. And also leaving the perfect amount of space for the battery bus bars that slide at the very top and very bottom of the battery packs. And that's where the cells get connected. So it's hard for 3D printers to print across something with nothing underneath to support it. And that's known as bridging. You can see the supports that I had to add to the design. Those are the lines that go through the circles to make sure that the arches are printed perfectly each and every time. After optimizing the design of the 3D prints, I was able to print two of these every single day. This took a lot of iterations of prototypes to get perfect. So it took over a month, 500 hours, and 20 kilograms of PLA plastic filament. That's about 40 pounds to get 76 battery modules. Now it's time to assemble these battery modules and the work is just getting started. So the first step was to take the battery cells out of all the little boxes that came in. There were so many little boxes. Step two, the battery module prints needed just a little bit of cleanup, just a little bit. Now all the supports that were added to the print to make sure it's printing correctly had to be removed by hand so that the cells can slide in and out perfectly. And there's almost 800 cell holes. One trick to doing this was just to use an old soldering iron to melt the rough edges. Step three, 
I took the brass strips and pushed them into the holders. As a background for choosing material for the bus bar connections, I decided to go with brass because it's relatively cheap. Pure copper would have been ideal because it's 100% conductive, but it's super expensive to buy. And gold is 70% conductive and it's even more expensive. And brass is 28% conductive and super cheap. A lot of people choose nickel, which is also a great option. It's super cheap and 22% conductive. And the fourth and final step is to put the battery cells into the battery modules One running change I made during the assembly process to speed things up was to build two battery packs together as one, because that's how they're going to go in the car anyway. And then solder a little fuse wire between the battery terminals and the bus bar. And then when everything is done, I do a little bit of QA by just sliding my fingers over the solder joints to make sure that they're pretty firm. So what does the fuse wire actually do? So this is something that Tesla pioneered. They start putting this in all their battery packs. It's actually this really thin wire that is designed to like burn up at a certain amperage and disconnect this cell, which may be having a problem individually. So that pack isolation protection is actually a really cheap and easy thing to do when you're designing these packs. And what I found was the leads of the resistor burn up at around five to six amps. So I'm designing the batteries to be able to pull around four amps out of each one max. So in my testing, five amps and six amps actual pulling out of this thin lead wire would actually cause the, the disconnect to happen. The, the fuse wire would actually burn up. So there's four amps, no problem, 4.5. Looks good to me. Now we're gonna set it to five. Five amps. Here you can see 5.5. And it's taking it pretty well still, which is pretty good. So this is gonna be six. 5.7, six. I think the color started to change in the middle. It's getting a little black down there. So you can see here that when I was testing it, when I got to the 5.5 or six amps, that fuse wire actually started burning up and disconnecting. After soldering dozens and dozens of cells, we got the build time down to 30 minutes for each dual link pack. After two weeks of work, we were able to finish the 38 dual link battery modules with almost 800 battery cells. I'm so happy how the batteries came out. It looks so good with the translucent holders and the green Panasonic cells. If you like this episode, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, hit the subscribe and notification buttons to be alerted for new episodes each Thursday. On the next episode of Building Enter Guides, we're going to actually install these battery modules into the platforms to build the battery packs. And then we're going to light them up with LEDs to test the warp floor visuals.